Hello and welcome to another edition of History After Hours. My name is Jeremy Nixon and I am joined by Kevin Pumphrey and Ron Franklin. We are three history teachers at Lakeside High School in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And we recorded this podcast on December the 1st, 2022 at Collective Coffee in beautiful downtown Hot Springs. Our podcast is student-driven, so you will hear us take questions and do our best to answer them. They range in a variety of topics from history to politics to sometimes just some silly and fun questions as well. We thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the podcast. Okay, we have another History After Hours episode live at Collective Coffee. We got a bunch of students looking at us, and they're going to start asking us questions. So, begin. (laughs) Uh, Hi, I'm Ellie Uldrich. Um, My question today is, is, um, what piece of media or pop culture influenced you the most? Sesame Street. (laughs) I mean, that's. Yes. I'm old. That's all we had. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's harken back with me to the to the days of the '70s. Three channels, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's the days before cable, and there's there's not a lot of options. So honestly, if I think about my childhood, the days before cable, we you know what we did? We we watched TV for like 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour on the you know, and then outside you go, kids. We weren't really saturated with media the way you guys are. Uh, we didn't have video on demand. We didn't have music on demand necessarily. There was a lot of outdoor activity because I'm that old. So I don't. I, that, my answer to that's going to be different maybe than you guys because I'm older than y'all. But an early standpoint, like I love me some Sesame Street, man. I still do actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what you got? I mean, yeah. I mean, Sesame Street is classic staple. I mean, I, Saturday morning cartoons, but I couldn't. I mean, there were so many I couldn't tell you because that's when we got them. Kind of like. Saturday morning was your time for cartoons. Um, Until about noon. Yeah, and then you were kicked off yeah. the TV and out of the living room and told to get outside. So as far as what, what about like print? Like I remember like, what was that? Like Highlights Magazine. Oh, oh yeah. Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things like that. The Scholastic Book Fair. You know, I, okay, here's a little side note. I read a thing the other day that said that some people are complaining that the Scholastic Book Fair is discriminatory. Really? Yeah, because they're like, it makes kids feel bad if they don't have a dollar for a book. And so I was, I was, conf- I was conflicted on how I felt about that. Because on one hand, I love the freaking book fair, man. It, was, I never, it never really dawned on me that there might be kids who were just like, there, that they couldn't get anything. You know, it never really, that never really crossed my mind. So while that's kind of a nostalgic, you know, positive thing for me, I wonder, now looking back, since I've read that, you know, I, was like, oh, I yeah. wonder how many kids were not in that position. Like, not like we had like... I couldn't buy lots of books, you know, like maybe once every quarter or something, we might get something. But uh, yeah, it got anyway, but, yeah, but I never really thought about it from that angle. So yeah. does that make me an elitist little kid? It also know. discriminates against kids who can't read. There you go. Uh, those, yeah. Yeah, so. There's right. always going to be a group of affected by stuff. I mean, I, all I think about with my childhood is sports. Now, I did the scholastic stuff. We had the book fairs and all that. But, man, I, my life was absorbed with sports to a degree that is – Probably unhealthy. Did you do Pizza Hut, the book it program, where if you read so many books, you got the free personal pan pizza? I did not. <laughs> no, I never even knew about that, boy. Yeah. I'd that on that. That kept me reading in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> what did they make you guys do? What, what's that thing called where you had to, like, you read, read books and you got points and you had to, what was that? Huh? AR. Oh, okay. Accelerated reader. Did you like that or no? Oh, okay. Well, I was just curious. Did it, did it encourage you to read? That's my point. Yeah. Or were you like bur- burned out by the time you got to the third grade? They would cheat on accelerated People reader tests. Cheated? What? No. no, kids don't cheat. That's <laughs> news to me. Okay, all right. But, yeah. So, if we're talking about media, just really quickly, we lived a different life than you do. We grew up where adults watched the same news, mm-hmm. and they kind of had the same reality of what's going on. And we as kids did not care about it. We right. didn't care about politics. We didn't know what was happening in the news. Parents took care of that. They yelled about stuff, but it was no... And, you know, we did kids stuff. We had no easy access to stuff were you, like you Were do. you ever at your grandparents and they had to watch their stories? Yes. Like the, so my oh, yeah. grandfather called. He didn't want to say soap opera because that sounded girly to him, apparently. I don't know. He's like, yeah, we're going to watch our too. stories now. Go outside. And so we, we couldn't interrupt that. We had to be super quiet while their stories were on. Yep. 
Because he couldn't miss what was happening on Days of Our Lives. <laughs> yeah, it was Days of Our Lives. <laughs> that was. was the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's a good one, but it's just, it's weird, you know? How old were you guys when you got your first uh, cell phones? Because my first cell phone was like, my first literally, it just rang. College. And maybe some texting. But I there was had, no... Mine just rang, but... I had the, no texting. I was the, an adult, the though. The back I mean, I phone kids. that plugged into the cigarette lighter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's a weird question for us, probably. What about you? What would you say, since you... Go back to the mic. <laughs> what would you say is your, like, influential media thing? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I love the book fairs, too. I don't know. I just had that question yeah. as an essay option for a scholarship. Uh, oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to answer this. It's too hard. Well, I like it, though. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So my name is Joshua Weed, and my question would be, so hypothetically, if Lexa Admin came up to you as history teachers and said, you can only teach through pre-approved packets about history lessons that they have vetted and who, decided are appropriate. Who, who pre-approved it? Like Lakeside Admin. They decided it was what kids need to know for history. Okay. How would you react, and in what ways would you change your teaching style? Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> uh, okay, well, so here's the thing. The admin at the school doesn't really control the curriculum. The state of Arkansas controls our curriculum. Legislators create assemblages of history teachers from around the state and other people who are sort of what we call shareholders, I guess. And then they will um, get together in probably, uh, what, every 15 years or so, and they will sort of go over the standards that we've set, and they'll modify if they need to or whatever. And then, But we get input, too. Like, they don't always just sort yeah. of, they don't just, like, throw it at us and go, here's what you will do. We know those standards, and we have them. We have access to them. And you can find them online, as a matter of fact, if you were curious. So there's that. But, but if, they're, but they're if standards. the admin came and said, you're going to do this, yeah. then we would come back with, well... Here's what the state says legally, so let's see how they compare. So we're because we're going to follow what the law says. Yeah, right. And but we're also and, and there, sorry, but there are also national standards too. Besides what Arkansas has, there's a national yeah. social studies standard. There's also facts, and <laughs> I, I'm not, I can't teach something if it doesn't align with evidence. So they yeah. can if they tell me to teach something, I'm cool with it as long as it still aligns with facts. Um, but. In the nature of teaching history, we're going to say some things that you may have never heard of that might be considered controversial, but that's just because you've never heard of that side of it. So sometimes history can get, because it's a social science, it's people, it's humans, and we're complicated, we, we contradict ourselves constantly, and that's, it's messy. And so yeah. there's well, no the, one way to teach it. The other thing about that is uh, if Lakeside Administration did that, uh, four out of my four periods out of my day are college board. You probably have as many. You have as many. Uh, so how many hundreds of kids just lost potential college credits because our courses are no longer in compliance with college board? So we're gonna have some mad mamas and dads. So I don't think that's gonna happen. Yeah, that that's a that's a great point too because the AP programs don't rely on the state standards. Yeah. They have their own curriculum that's set and ge- governed to us basically which we then have to get their approval. We have to show them that we're teaching their standards. And if we aren't doing that, they can actually remove our AP accreditation and we can't teach those classes anymore. They can actually pull that from us. We we're allowed to teach those classes is what I'm saying. So if the, if the, if our school or if the state changed, like it could actually jack up that whole program. And you're right. College credit for a lot of kids would be on the, on the line. Yeah. That's, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, Hi, my name is Molly Outler. And uh, so my question is, if you were Muppet, which Muppet would you be? I'm the frog. Is that what you're going to do? Hi-ho. Yeah, you're going to do it that way. I drew a Muppet blank for a minute. Muppet. (laughs) I couldn't think. Animal? You can't think of any Muppets? (laughs) I was thinking music. Your hair's not long to be the animal, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Yeah, what's that one that makes no sense? It just makes noises. Can I be that one? Yeah. I always liked Grover. (laughs) I don't know why. Me too. I thought of Grover the first one. He seems like a history he's just kind teacher. Of a, he's just kind of nice, <laughs> yeah, you know, you a little goofy. Yeah. <laughs> now that you said it, yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. So there's different, like, I actually like the Muppet Babies. Muppet Babies, we make our dreams come true. Puppy, do you walk down? Anybody? <laughs> no. <laughs> they had an imagination. And I, I, I don't know, I kind of like, y'all were talking about s- cartoons or stuff. Like, Muppet Babies, I actually watched that. Because they were in there, they were trapped in their room. Nanny, who came in, you just saw her socks. For you guys, it might be kind of like the Magic School Bus. That kind of vibe. Except it was called Muppet Babies. Hang on, do you know the Magic School Bus? Okay, okay. I'm just making sure. (laughs) But I like that kind of imaginative. I think that's why I like sci-fi and fantasy films I don't know. Every year, more and more things they don't know that... I know. Yeah, you know, it's always a risk. We bring up some sort of some sort of pop culture reference 
I, you know, sometimes you don't get any looks at all. And I'm like, do you know what I'm talking about? And like, well, yeah. no, we don't watch that anymore. Okay, well, so. Yeah. Next. Right. Hi, I'm Jacob Moss. Um, since the world population recently hit 8 billion people, do you think that overpopulation is an issue or upcoming issue? And if so, why? I used to rant and rave. If you just go back a few years on the podcast, you'll hear me rant and rave about overpopulation. However, I'm open to evidence, and some experts think that actually overpopulation looks like it's going to tap out at nine because so many fewer people are having kids in some of the richer countries like ours, and our population's going down so much that also there's going to be some other factors that, like COVID, that will help to level out some of the population problems we might or might not have. So I'm not as actually as worried about it, overpopulation as I was a couple years ago. However, it is shocking when you think about Teddy Roosevelt, who was president in 1901 to 1908, the earth had about 1.5 billion, and now it has nearly eight. No, it, it passed eight. It did just recently. So, yeah, yeah and then all of a sudden it ex exploded, and that's because of the Industrial Revolution, and we're able to feed people, and people are living longer in medicine and... Do you hear our um, average age decreased yet again two years in a row? So we're actually dying sooner in America. Yeah. So we're having fewer babies and we're dying sooner. So I, maybe overpopulation isn't going to be. It's going to take care of itself. Yeah. Maybe. If Unfortunately, all, some of that average is also suicide. How, well, rates I wonder how much exploding. of that is the the absolute garbage that we inhale on a daily yeah, basis as a culture. Foods and right. And so yeah. many so many non foods. I challenge you to go home or to keep a food diary if you've never done that. And see how much food you eat that's not actually real food. I mean, I wonder, right? Check, do that sometime. Do yourself a favor and look at that and go, wow, I'm poisoning myself with all these chemicals. I mean, really, just pay attention. And what, once again, I just want to reiterate one, and I don't want to dwell on suicide, but when a lot, large number of people that are teens commit suicide, that definitely skews your numbers, average age down. People are still living as long as people have always lived. You know, back in the day, you know, there was typhoid fever, there's malaria, there's all these things that took you out quicker. Now we can live to a certain age, but in 2012, especially among teenage girls, the suicide rates are horrible, eight times or something just in America. <laughs> uh, and uh, get, for men, it's, for boys, it's not that bad, but it's, it doubled. So just think about that. That really helped to skew this as well. And some of that is mental health and, unfortunately, social, Instagram, Twitter, likes, all of that stuff that can mess with your mind and isolate you from other human beings. That's a, that goes down a dark path, but... Social media is the answer to the overpopulation problem? Unfortunately. Forget about asteroids. Forget about epidemic diseases. Social media. Hi, um, my name is Delaney, and my question is, which Renaissance artist do you think has had more of an impact on modern society and art between Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, and Raphael? So you want to know which favorite answer. Ninja Turtle we have? Okay. <laughs> I think the most influential artist is Michelangelo. Final answer. Yeah, I would agree. Same. <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> like, Greatest sculptor of all time, for sure. <laughs> Nobody comes close sculpting. And then maybe, what, top ten painter, for sure. Maybe. It's hard to do both. Great. And he was really great at both. Heck of a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> I never got into the Ninja Turtles. I don't know why. <laughs> Just something that passed me by. I still remember the cheat codes for the Ninja Turtles game on, on I, the original Nintendo. I expected that. Uh, I'm Lauren Lewis, and what do you think is the most ridiculous Christmas or other holiday tradition? Oh. Fruitcake <laughs> is evil. <laughs> it is really <laughs> gross. Nobody I know likes fruitcake, but we used to, I used to work in grocery stores before I became a teacher, and we would, we would have truckloads of fruitcake come in. People were like, would be like clamoring at the door, when's your fruitcake coming in? And I'm like, you people really? No, I think people use it as like doorstops or weapons. Like, right, I don't think you actually eat it. I don't know. I, I wonder if you like put a fruitcake out on a, on a rail somewhere out in, the, out in nature, if you could come back in 100 years, if it would still just be there watching and lurking to jump on the next unsuspecting victim. Like, who needs fruit in cake? That's, that's, that's a horrible idea. So that's my answer. Fruitcake. Mine is New Year's Eve. We all get together, and we wait. And we stare. <laughs> and then finally, by ah! All right, get your coats. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's that magic moment. Uh, yeah. Is there any other time when people do that? Is there a countdown for anything no, else? That one like that? second. Ten. Nine. <laughs> this is what we've dreamed of. 
<laughs> and then you just go home. <laughs> Y2K felt like it might have been some more than that, but it wasn't. <laughs> they don't know about Y2K. Look at them. They have That's drawn true. a blank. I think once you said fruitcake, I got really <laughs> perturbed at marshmallow peeps. Oh, no. Okay. No, I'm not changing my answer, but marshmallow peeps <laughs> is a good one. Oh, That's more Easter, that. though, isn't it? Aren't marshmallow peeps more Easter than yeah, Christmas? But, but any holiday, right? Those are also, holiday. speaking of non-food, don't, don't eat peeps. What is a peep? What is a peep, actually? It's like, so I are peep. they? Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep you know, it. My, my peeps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so. I'm, hmm, yeah. I'm really sleep deprived. <laughs> or Franklin Apparently. broke my brain before we started. Okay, yep, go. Okay, hi. I'm Natalie Shunk, and... Um, this doesn't have to get like personal or anything, but I was wondering, like, in the past like five years, what's been the worst family fight that you've had to witness in like a holiday or something like that? Uh, my family is devoid of emotion, so <laughs> <laughs> the robots. really we don't have fights. I really, I mean, I've I've been blessed. My family's very loving. Don't get me wrong. But we just, we, it, we're old school. We're farmers. We, we don't talk yeah. about politics. Just we don't talk feelings. about religion. We don't talk about sex. Mm. We hug each other, say we love each other, and we'll see you next year. And Countdown at New yeah. Year's. Countdown yeah. yeah. New Year's, <laughs> high five. But yeah, I, I grew up in a really peaceful family, and our Thanksgivings are real cordial and nice. And we have family drama, but it's all kind of done under, you know, with one-on-one, off in the corner. And so I've been really fortunate. Yeah, I, same. I, my story is different than that, but we don't fight. But it's not because we're nice. It's because everybody's so scattered. Like most of my family is either <laughs> gone away, moved away, or like gone away. And so you know, we've always kind of just avoided each other, so we don't have to fight. I guess you know, I don't know. I'm Sabrina Long, and I kind of have a similar question. I was wondering how your Thanksgiving was this year. I killed my older brother. It was pretty bad. <laughs> It, so I guess I go back on that whole not. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. And you were thankful. He I was, was, I was so thankful. He's out of my life. <laughs> Mine's going to be really depressing if I tell the truth. Oh, no. Okay, well, you just hold that little depressing thought. Mine was fine. Kevin's was fine. Go, Nixon. <laughs> no, well, I mean, we had my grandfather. He's passed away, but his last remaining sibling passed away after Thanksgiving dinner. Um, at, at the table? No, he had made it home. Oh. But then also my younger cousin second cousin has um cancer on his spine and in the bone marrow and he does not have a good prognosis and we found that out all over thanksgiving wow so is it was it that kind of revelation at the table or was it no like it over pie like how did that come out no i mean it was like the couple of days leading up to and so the normal family gathering just didn't happen oh because um he was in the hospital and they couldn't come down and then um, his other kids went to my grandmother's house and they had the flu and brought it with them and gave it to her. And oh then, I mean, it was just like, yeah, that's weird. It yeah. was so, um, so you were thankful when it was over. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, it was a stressful holiday, but I mean, still things to be thankful for is, you know, yeah, but that's a, they can all be good. That's a lot all at once though. Yeah. Yeah. That was a yeah. lot. Hmm. Well, sorry, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> question. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm Samantha Long, and this is a dumb question, but what's the best Girl Scout cookie? Thin mints. If they're in the freezer, from the freezer, but if not, I want a Samoa. Uh, the what? The Samoas. Like the oh, yeah. oh, yeah, those are good, too. But I love a frozen Thin Mint. Very particular never tried, uh, never about tried that. that. <laughs> How'd you discover that? I don't know, actually. I don't remember who first put them in the freezer. You buy too many, and you have to freeze Maybe. them. Maybe. Uh, yeah, it probably product. happened like that. I don't know. I just remember them being in the freezer. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I concur. Jason Momoa. I mean, <laughs> Samoa. Samoa. Is that it? All righty. Step on up. Is that still a thing? I think it's still a thing. Is it still a thing? Hello. My name is Liam Jeffers. And um, my question has to do with politics. So pretty much. Surprise. Yeah, I know, right? I thought I'd do a serious one. So as we know, the states have to at least be republics to be a bit silly, how far <laughs> can you stretch that? So basically in one direction, how far can you go to be like a direct democracy and how far can you go to be like a complete autocracy? Yeah, I, The answer is we don't know, honestly, because it, legally speaking, hasn't been challenged or really put to the test. I mean, 
like the craziest they've got is a unicameral legislature um, in Nebraska. Uh, you know, I think we're moving closer to things like uh, a direct democracy. You, you, I mean, you, I know you know about ranked choice voting and things like that that are taking place. See, the Constitution is a weird thing. Uh, you know, it's, it ensures that, like you said, that every state has a Republican form of government. To me, that means representation in some manner. Uh, the Supreme Court that I know of hasn't ever had to step in and say, no, that's not representative. So unless, you know, they're going to make one of us king, I don't think, I mean, I think it's going to be cool. So I cannot become a dictator? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go no. Pretty sure. Co- I, which I almost A, con- a constitutional dictator. I almost answered that. Are you asking me how to be the dictator <laughs> of the proletariat? Reason. But I don't have an answer. I'll let you know when I figure it out. That's sketchy. Okay. okay, so my name is Reagan Moshears, um, and this is a hypothetical that uh, we've both been talking about for a long time. So if each of the departments at Lakeside High School, like the history department, the math department, science department, fine arts, if all of you guys were put on an island in the middle of the ocean, which department would go first and which would last the longest? Y'all been talking about this for a long time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that in itself is worrisome. But I suddenly had a picture of like... Mackinville coming from the trees at me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. Mackinville is the survivor. Yeah, I think I, I, think I would vote so. for her. I think she is. It's like she's got a deadly speed walk and can get in the trees. Okay, but she doesn't have a mountain. <laughs> Fueled by Diet Mountain Dew. Someone should write this story. Um, <laughs> Um, I think she's the last one. I don't know that the English department wins, though. Yeah, the, yeah. I mean, it, it, she may become her own. She may turn on her own people. You know, so I don't know. Yes, that's Vigilantism. Yes, I, I can see that, though. I can, too. I'm not making an alliance <laughs> with her and turn on y'all. Know, that's <laughs> what I'm thinking. I'm like... How quickly? Maybe, I mean, if the science boys bring some of their, you know, chemicals that they yeah, can poison us with, I mean, that do? might be... That might be a problem. I don't know. We do have historical knowledge of tactics, though. We know about all these devious things, but we ourselves aren't really We're that thinkers. Devious. We're not doers. People, yeah. We need, you know, yeah, so science people are doers. Like, they, they have to do stuff. They go to we, labs. If we could make someone sick and then fling bodies. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, we'd have to get with the science people to get the trebuchet to yeah, work. Yeah, maybe you know? that's, yeah. So, there would have to be, yeah, there would have to be partnerships, maybe. We'll have to think about this. I we s- could I be the most devious, though, probably. I like yes, the Yes, I do answer, think that though. we could be the most... Yeah. Machiavellian, maybe? Maybe. Mm. Yeah. Hi, my name is Atticus Webb. This is another hypothetical. Okay. So let's say there are no students and no other teachers other than five that you can pick, and there's a wild gorilla on the loose in, in the Lakeside <laughs> High School building, and it's trying to kill you. You can use any of the resources in the building, but you cannot leave the building. What five do you pick, and what is your game plan? Machiavelli. I know, Machiavelli. We <laughs> just need one. <laughs> The gorilla would beg for mercy. I don't know. That's a very specific scenario. It is, isn't it? Yeah. How do you... I don't know. Is it a baby gorilla? <laughs> like, how big is this thing? Is it, it is an adult silverback gorilla. Okay. Now we're screwed. <laughs> you ever seen one of those, like, up close? Yeah. Yeah. School resource officers have weapons. Hey, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We get Burrell. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah, our answer. That's, 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 that's See, we're problem solvers. Yep. <laughs> Uh, my name is Robert Bledsoe. Who would you consider to be the most powerful couple in all of history? Uh, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand? That's a pretty good oh, answer. Oh, yeah, that's a good answer. Victoria and Albert? See, I was going to go maybe that direction. British Empire, Victoria and Albert, like they're the, the amount of people that they controlled. Like That's a pretty good answer. Yeah, I think that's, She's, I think that's I where mean, I would go. Power couple, though. Power, I mean, yeah, said, I mean, he's a little... He's a little stand backish. Yeah, that's you know? true. So, just sitting in Theodore. <laughs> I mean, that's a good one too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm Grady Oman, and how well do you think the U.S. handled the pandemic? The most recent one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, not as well as I'd hoped. Uh, that's probably the most generous answer I can give. We yeah, we we had lots of time to prepare for put infrastructure in place, put norms of activity. You know, here's what we should be working on. Here's who will respond at this particular time if this kind of thing happens. And I don't know if we just got complacent or uh, if, there was, if the bureaucracy is so bloated at times that it, you know, one group thinks it's their job, one group thinks it's their job, or they don't think it's anybody's job and they're waiting for somebody else to take care of it. Like I, the, you know, but once you realize it was, uh, what? okay, let me back up just a little bit. Part of the, when you realize that 
it's come out of China and pl- landed in, let's say, Italy. It was really getting hit one of the hardest places in, in Europe first. And you're watching thousands of people go to the hospital. And we're still sitting here in our little isolated chamber going, well, it's bound to not cross the ocean. You know, I mean, that was, that's a weird moment of inactivity where I, we could have been at least, you know, but, but on the other hand, then you go, we depend on international trade and we depend on international movement. And how, how well do you then try to quarantine or govern? You know, I'm so, I don't, so not being in that position, it's hard for me to, to criticize, honestly. But it just seems like there could have been more coordinated efforts to try to find out when we might be vulnerable or uh, what, what, a, what could we try to close some things down earlier to keep it from spreading as fast as it did. Like, I, I don't know. I will give our scientists an A for getting the vaccine. The vaccine was my, developed, was my yeah, one caveat quickly. there, that, that rapid development of, of that. But, you know, even that was kind of weird because some people were like, it's, it happened too fast. We can't trust the vaccine. I heard people say that. Well, well, it's but it was it was based on an ex- if they had actually stopped to listen and read news. You talk about real facts like a while ago. If you actually checked out the facts as opposed to what's was happening with your you know your drunk uncle around the table or what was happening being on Snapchat, uh, if people were paying attention, they would have realized that there was a vaccine that was similar that was then used and modified to bring this to the table uh, more quickly. So it was much more trustworthy than people realized. I think, and I think that's part of my critique. Then is. Uh, I think from from a governmental standpoint, getting the message out there sooner about here's how you protect yourself, here's how you protect other people, here's your social responsibility and your civic responsibility, here's your here's our health codes and let's do that because there were so many mixed messages coming from so many different people, different states, uh, all the way up through the CDC and the World Health Organization, all the way up through the Office of the Presidency, and you know I mean everybody kind of had a different message and people were confused and that, that I think cost time money and lives and that's tragedy you know and we're so. a federal system like i wouldn't trade what we did for like the lockdowns of china no I don't no want that. that's not what i mean so like it is hard for a nation to control 50 states that have different rules and we we want to have a federal system where states can make their own decisions some states handled it better than others um it's complicated politics got involved so quickly that's what i'm most disheartened at Mm -hmm. is how quickly it became political i thought i used to say on the podcast go back and listen an alien attack or a virus would unite our country and i the biggest disappointment was that it made it even worse so who's to say an alien attack wouldn't make our politics even worse hillary sent the aliens no it was trump (laughs) uh you know it's just like good grief i mean It didn't matter. Like, the virus didn't care if you were Republican or Democrat. And it's a shame that... But but I will give props, once again, to the scientists who had to get into a lab and develop this, you know, and get us out of the But it's not like But it's not like we didn't know we were unprepared, because I've got on my wall, I've got a a bunch of Time magazine covers on the wall that sort of, like, here's hotspot things from from history. And in 2017, you can come to my room and look at it, it's on the wall. 2017, Time magazine, on the front page, it says, we are not ready for the next pandemic. We're not ready for the next viral outbreak. 2017. So the, it, there were indications then that we were woefully prepared for something, something monumental like this, right? And then it comes and slams us. And we and got lucky. Like, this should be the dress rehearsal for what could happen. Yeah. We could have dealt with a much deadlier virus, and we got lucky with COVID, actually. I know a lot of people died, but it could have been way worse, and we weren't prepared. Have we done anything since then to be more prepared? I don't know. I'll give you a big fat for instance, though. My mother, who is like, well, she was 78 she, then. Um, she had a lot of her friends like, well, you know, it's not a big deal. And it, it was really hammered down on the older generations. That, right? They were the most vulnerable. You, you saw in a lot of places, even here in the United States, like um, uh, nursing homes and things were really being hammered hard. Right. And people shipped out daily, honestly. And uh, she's coming. And she's like, well, I just don't know if it's that bad. And I said, well, listen. <laughs> Like, you have got to stay away. She wanted to go to church. She wanted to do all these things. And I, I, look, I, I'm glad you want to be around people. I'm glad you want to do stuff. But you need to think about your health. But, but she was in that trap of, right, of, of some of that misinformation or she didn't really think it was as bad as it actually was. So, I mean, you know, sometimes you don't see what's right in front of you, right, until it's much more maybe too late. So we got lucky that, you know, she wasn't affected by it. I, I mean, if we face something like this again, I hope we do a better job. I really do. Put, put the politicians aside. Listen to, listen to scientists, you know. Shut all those boys up and just listen to people who know what's going on. Medical people, scientists, that's great. Hi, I'm Daniel Montgomery. So last year we talked about, like, the dynastic cycle. And I was wondering, um, because the U.S. is, like, upward, like, latter half of 200 years. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how old it is. So how much longer do you think the U.S. has before it 
you know, succumbs to that cycle? Or do you think the U.S. won't succumb to that cycle? Oh, we will. I think we're in the aging period, and I think it depends on what happens next and the choices we make that will determine how we either recover from that or we change regimes. No, a, a, a change in our system doesn't mean full collapse either. Right. Right. It doesn't mean it's ruinous and, you know, Canada invades and that's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but it could mean some sort of existential shift in politics or, or the dynamics of who's, who gets to participate, who doesn't different restrictions, censorships, like those things could be different after the fact, right? Freedom of movement, freedom of discussion, freedom to assemble, like those things could be challenged. And, and some of the freedoms that we've seen, that have been established over the, let's say the last 10 to 15 to 20 years are honestly like we're seeing this weird. If if you look at our history, it's been about expansion, expansion of ideas, expansion of principles, expansion of privileges, expansion of liberties until recently. And you're seeing a full stop on some things, plus a reversal in action and plans for more reversals. And so that's a weird sign. Like there's a regression and our country's always been about progress, you know, or at least, pushing towards, somebody grinding it out, trying to be better, trying to, right? And I, I, that's not necessarily, we don't see the indications that that's going to continue. Maybe it will. We hope that it will, you know? But uh, it's going to take some real cooperation from people on both ends of that spectrum to, uh, to find some consensus and move on. That's my opinion. Hi, Hi. I'm Lauren Latham. Hey. Who are you cheering for in the World Cup, and who's your favorite player? Oh, uh, see, you're going to call me out like that. What is the World Cup and who is playing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to have to go with America. I, but I, I actually honestly, like the U.S. team. Yeah, I know you do. So, okay, so Nixon's all over this. I'm going to admit to you that I don't know that much about it. Like, I, we weren't, I wasn't raised in an age where soccer was that important. F- international football. Uh, but, I mean, I respect it, but I just don't know that much about it. Honestly. But, you know, my students got me involved and interested in it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, my first year here, it was Torrin Davis and that oh, game. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and that's when I started watching and, and getting interested. And in, uh, my interest is built through the years. The first World Cup I watched was the the last one. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I, of course I want the U.S. to win. Do I think they're going to? Sure. Probably not. Favorite player, oh. the guy that scored the other day and got hurt in the process and yeah. still walked off the field with his head held high. Whatever his name is, Christian that guy. Christian okay, Pulisic. So I, yeah. I heard the story. Kids were like, he got hit in the... Uh, yeah, he got hit in the... He scored, area. and then there was a tap back, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, so, okay. And he's hey, really good. He's sounded, to, but... Let me I, interrupt you with yeah. this, because, and I'm not going to name names, but somebody, we were having this conversation the other day, after the United States win, and you were talking about, oh, soccer, blah, blah, and then somebody said... Communist. Uh, yes. Uh, can, you, can you explain that train of thought? Because I don't get where soccer and communism kind of become the same thing. I don't know that I can explain that train of thought. Um, no. I don't know how to what extent to tell that story. Um, <laughs> there was a question presented to me by someone at school. I'll just kind of leave it at that. Right. Yeah. Um, they were asking why there were so many USA shirts, what was going on, what game everybody was talking about, because I had kids running up to me, please come watch the game, please come on. Like, I have to teach. I Literally, I have to teach. I would like to watch the game as well, but I have to teach. Um, and the, I was turning people away at the door, Clint. And um, <laughs> the, someone asked me about, you know, why the commotion, why kids screaming what game it was about. I was like, oh, it's the World Cup. It's U.S. Um, soccer. And, he, and the response was, communist. I just don't get that. What a, uh, it's not American. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, and I, I do think it's that, I, 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 that it's not our primary sport. Um, I coached it for five years. And my last game to coach, I quit coaching right after that, and I haven't watched soccer since. It wasn't something I grew up with. I was, and if you're going to be a coach, by the way, you might have to coach soccer too. You never know, or wrestling or whatever. They just make you coach stuff. But, you know, I was basketball, football, and all that. If you look at the top three sports, football, basketball, baseball, they're kind of ours in a way, even though they're, they all were borrowed from other, you know, we could go through the history of it. I mean, football is really ours, but it's rugby that we kind of adopted in baseball, and basketball was actually invented here. There's something about Americans where it's, it, this is ours, and we were all into it. I mean, hockey well, is, is the same Is it because kind of, of the international well, aspect of it that the person was like going it down there? It should be a huge year? deal. I think so. But, I mean, I'm just speculating. But, yeah, I mean. But there's a Canadian team in the Major League Baseball. So sure. I mean, 
Yeah. So does that count as communist stuff too? Then, <laughs> well, it's American. I have to pose the question. For that I don't part. know. Um, I don't know. But, I, it, just, but I told, it struck me as odd yeah, yeah. that somebody would say that, and I was just curious that, uh, for the explanation. You know, I use those examples when we talk about hypernationalism. I, I, I say, what do we call the Super Bowl champions, world champions? How many countries participate in it? Yeah, yeah. And then they, everybody stops and thinks for a second. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas the World Cup is maybe that's it. It's global. It's international, and therefore un-American. It's been the number one sport internationally forever. Like, it, it dominates world sports. But in America, it's like, just now, this is the, the first generation that's really paid attention. Even though we call it soccer and they call it football, we can't claim it as our own now, and it has to be some fancy foreign sport that we can't appreciate. I don't oh, just know. watch. If we get close to winning this thing, there will be a bunch of soccer fans. Oh, there are. We're amazing. number one. I knew she it. She just wanted to know who our favorite player was, who we're rooting for. And I couldn't name one oh, player. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think... I, I like Tyler Adams. I think he's doing a good job as far as the American team. I think Christian Pulisic is. I think Kylian Mbappe is very talented. I think France could win it again. I don't know if they will. What did you um, think about the Iranian team? Is Pele still at playing? Home based on their because <laughs> they, they they protested at yeah. some point. They didn't, didn't sing you, the didn't national you anthem. You, did you hear specifically that they were under threat now? Um, they, I know that they had received some threats, and there was a man in Afghanistan who celebrated the U.S.'s win that got killed. No, I saw that. Honor, yeah, yeah, honor killing. I think you sent me that, too. You're not going to get here. them fighting over it's, whether it's, you know, Messi or Ronaldo. So, I mean. I've heard those names. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they build a statue of that one? I've, I've heard names. Uh-huh. Go. Uh, I'm Cohen Oswald, and uh, I was wondering – Obviously, Mr. Nixon was a, a lawyer before he became a teacher, That's and I was, obvious. I was wondering, yeah. just look at it. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, you guys had careers before you were teachers, that uh, and why you decided to become a teacher, and like, was there like a turning event or something like that? I was also a lawyer, and uh, <laughs> no, it's not true. I'm, I'm a teacher. Like my first real job, I mean, okay, farming, teaching, personal training in the middle, coaching, which is really teaching. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lifer. Yeah, I actually spent uh, the first half of my career uh, managing retail grocery stores around the state. So um, from independence to, uh, to uh, national chains. Um, 1776? But, uh, from independence? <laughs> <laughs> How old from, are you? From the independence of America. You are immortal. The he first is grocery immortal. stores. Yeah, yeah so, but I mean around, so Hot Springs Village, uh, Benton, Little Rock, uh, a little bit here in Hot Springs. So, um, but the, the, the hours were killing me. And uh, my wife, who's a teacher, she just said, look, you, sh- you really would be good at this. You should go back and try. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Do I even like kids? You know, <laughs> I wasn't even sure. But she, she actually encouraged me and convinced me. And, and so took the bullet and went back to school, you know, as an adult. And, uh, and here I am. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm so happy that I did, too. Like, this is the best decision I've ever made as far as career goes. Like, I love it. But I don't know that I'd have been as good at this if I hadn't done that first. You know what I mean? Because managing, it's not just about managing the store. And it's about inventories and yeah, you got to keep track of all that stuff. But it's really about managing people and dealing with the customers and, you know, that, that, that relationship that you build between the community and the people that are working there and trying to, like, that's, that's most of what I liked about that, actually. And so it really kind of helped, was a, it was a weird sort of training field for what I'm doing now. I think it helps me be better at this. But we're, you know, we're very specific. I wouldn't be a happy math teacher probably oh, no. unless I learned to do it. Which I learned to do this, you know, being a history teacher wasn't something I was born with either. It took me five or six years before I got any good you know, at there it. There are people who are passionate about math. I just, I don't see that. I can't make that connection. I'm glad they're there. But yeah, I agree. Like this is, you got to, if you're going to teach, you got to kind of find the thing, you know. Yeah, because there's, you could be in college teaching and then there's, you know, primary school teachers and that I couldn't do. God so, but money, time and control, those seem to be the three factors that can make someone happy. Not necessarily in that order. And um, also, if, if you grow up doing other things that are hard, teaching is not, I mean, it can be taxing, but it's nothing like farming, and I really love it. I'm indoors. <laughs> I don't get sunburn teaching. It's great. And uh, Mr. Nixon, was there like a certain thing that happened that made you want to not be a lawyer anymore? Because you said you felt like a horrible person. I was just wondering. Like, Yeah, well, I mean, essentially, how can I tell this and not drone on? Um, when I first started practicing law, I was doing things that made a difference. You I were felt good idealistic. About them. Yeah, I was. I was very idealistic. If you watch Parks and Recreation, I was Leslie Nope. And I thought I could help. And I started out as a child abuse and maltreatment attorney for DHS. And within less than two years, I, was, uh, I had over 200 active cases 
um, rolling at any given period in 27 counties. I was in court every day. Uh, I was putting thousands of miles on my car. I was in a suit and tie 14 hours a day. Um, I was underpaid. I was overworked. And I was like, I am mentally and physically exhausted. I was like, okay, so maybe I can make a difference elsewhere. Tried to do that. Tried to go into um, employment law, labor law. Uh, went and worked for the Department of Workforce Services, unemployment, things like that. Uh, unemployment um, administrative law judge. I make a make it quicker. I rose through the ranks, and then it, I got in politics. And once you get to the level of you're working for a political appointee, there are just things that happen that you don't agree with, and you no longer like doing so and you chose not to sell your soul to oh yeah his, yeah 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 well you know when that first teaching paycheck came in at about oh 40 something percent of what i used to make yeah it was <laughs> yeah yeah it was rough I, 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 the, the quote that i give when people ask me about it, it's like Don't, didn't you make more money yes as a, as like yeah well half the money twice as happy yeah, yeah. No, it, I mean, it's my physical health, it's my mental health, it's my well-being. I love doing it, and I always steal Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is to work hard at worth worth doing. Nice. Yep. Hi, I'm Lexi Hammonds. What's the best advice you've been given about teaching history? The best advice we've been given? Oh, okay. Mm. Who, were, who, who did you look up to when you first started? Like, you, you had mentor, you had Remo, yeah. Remo. Um, you know, first year, second year, third year teachers, we try to be cool, laid back, and then kids walk all over us. And I remember he just looked at me and he goes, because I was having a lot of classroom management problems, and he just looked at me and said, work them. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, maybe that'll help. <laughs> and so I started teaching bell to bell. And this is back when I stood up and did a lot of lecture and stuff. It wasn't my forte. But I don't know. I mean, I think the the biggest advice that would help would is if you love it, that hopefully will show. So I don't think, I don't know how you can be a good teacher unless you love it. Unless you, or at least love the, say, I love the subject. Somebody goes, do you love teaching students? Mm. I love history. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> and so I just hope that they see how much I love it. But if, you know, I, that's, that's all I can hang my hat on is I just love the, the subject so much and I'm interested in it so the yeah. best advice I got was from my mentor teacher at Hot Springs a guy named Dave Simmons and uh and he knew he and I hit it off pretty well right we had similar personalities and uh and I liked the way he interacted in class and stuff and so he pretty quickly he just sort of turned me loose that was kind of the way we did it then you go you know like one day's worth of orientation is all I got in class we go all right I'll see you in a week you know he but he would kind of come around and watch but I, I had, like, I knew the content. I just knew it when I was talking stuff. And then after, after school was over, he'd come back and we'd have, like, little breakout sessions, you know, and he'd say, okay, well, here's what you did and try to adjust this or whatever. And I thought I had done, like, a hell of a job, man. I was like, boy, I nailed that. And he goes, Ron, he goes, who are you talking to? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, you were telling stuff, but you were over their heads. They were not connecting with you. Like, you didn't, you didn't connect with the kids. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He said, you, were, you had, it's great information. You had all kinds of stuff, but you didn't actually right? You were, were you talking to them or were you just talking? And I was like, oh, dang. And so I've always made it like a real clear mission past that point to not just do the content or whatever, but to like, right, I'm talking to people, not talking at people. And, that, and once I realized how to do that, then, it, you know, it just sort of clicked. I think that's the best advice I've ever heard. So I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the best advice about teaching. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to start carrying kids <laughs> I'm going to look at people. <laughs> I, I don't know that my, so my, I guess my mentor teacher was a lady at Crossed named Liddell Collins. She was um, Crossed's version of you, actually. Um, and she was great. And I, I don't even remember what exactly had gone wrong. Something had gone wrong. Um, and it was my first year. And I was uh, upset. And I'm like, the kids are upset. And I'm upset. And I'm sure there were going to be parents upset. And she just goes, who cares? <laughs> And I went, what? She goes, who cares? I went, well, what do you mean? <laughs> She's like, is it going to matter tomorrow? Because if it's not going to matter tomorrow, leave it alone. And that meant a lot to me. Like, don't, don't sweat the little stuff. Like, everybody's going to have those screw-ups. And my life got much easier after that. Um, and then when I got to Lakeside, because I came from a school that was very micromanagerial, and I went into an environment that was... Um, 
at the time very trusting of what we were doing, and they still are. Don't I'm not trying to say they're not. Um, but I was very. I came from a very, like I said, micromanagerial spot. And <laughs> Franklin, just, every every time I asked him something, he's like, "Just do your thing. Like, stop worrying about all these hoops and this and that. And do your thing." And so yeah, those it's, two it's, things it's, together. When you came to us, it was almost like you had been abused. <laughs> Because you were like, well, don't we have to? I was like, yeah. you just need to calm down, bro. Like, look, just yeah. go do your thing. It's going to be all right. Yeah, yeah well, so. and there, sadly, there are teachers, and I was. It was so regimented and do this and turn it in by this, and if you don't do this, you get written up, and there's no I can statement. And, we, and, we are very fortunate to yeah. be at a school that trusts us to be professionals, to handle our content, to do our thing, to be what we need to be, and, and they don't you know, hover over us and... And, uh, but there are schools that are very much yeah. different. Uh, yeah, like you'll have an administrator in your room kind of peering over, and if you don't have these weird documentations that really don't mean anything to the kids or the, or the classroom environment, but they're checking boxes administratively, like bureaucratic BS, it, there's a lot of that going on now, and it's making, it, it makes the school environment tense. It makes teachers on, on, on edge. On, yeah, like, you, like you're just not going to deliver unless you're comfortable in the environment where you are. We talk a lot about the environment for the students, but it's also about the environment for us. You know, like ha- let us be what we need to be so that we can be what we need to be for you. And, and it's just not like that everywhere. So we're actually very happy to be where we are and, and to work together too. We, I know we say that a lot, but yeah. we're really fortunate to have each other. Hi, I'm Grace Ann. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, my question is a little bit less like school related. Theoretically, if you were on death row, what would you be on death row for? <laughs> oh my god! Oh no! I, I said happy birthday too early. Theoretically, if you were on death row, <laughs> death. What would it be for? Are we just are we, hypothetically right? Of course. Of course. <laughs> Supreme Court said corporations are people. If I kill Solution Tree, will I be on death row? <laughs> Arson is the answer. Uh, wow. Oh, man. Uh, what does it take to get... What, okay. <laughs> okay you're, let's you're, see. Lawyer, man. <laughs> give me some things that are capital offenses. Uh, and Arkansas, then I will pick and choose from that. Uh, well, premeditated murder with the intent. That will get you in Arkansas. Um, high treason. Not just murder, but premeditated murder? <laughs> yeah, so to get the ca- like the death penalty, death penalty in Arkansas, you you got to get the, to that. Not the light death penalty, not the easy. Like li- yeah, I mean, yeah, between life sentence and, you know, uh, oh, lethal injection. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's it? Pretty much, yeah. That's, okay. the only, that's the only capital offense in this state? Pretty much, yeah. We have to go to another state. <laughs> <laughs> find, find other options for our <laughs> Uh, well, tre- yeah. uh, um, treason. treason. And you want to so, go the federal route? Yeah, I mean, I suppose high treason. Okay. Yeah. So, depending on our governmental choices in the next ten to twenty years, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It'll take a lot of planning. Uh-oh. I don't even. We're know. We're hatching what. a treasonous plot, said the Supreme Court in 1807. I'm not hatching anything, bro. <laughs> like hypothetically, I don't know. I don't think premeditated murder. You know? Okay, no. I, I mean, be like grounded for just a second. Somebody messes with my grandchild. I was thinking the same thing. That's uh, the yeah. only thing that could get me to the level of... I, to mess with I will life. premeditate your murder. <laughs> 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 I mean, so that's probably my answer. What a dark question. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? At the same time, man. I don't think I had that gear till I had children. And then I think about somebody messing with my kid and the rage that I can develop in a daydream <laughs> <laughs> makes me think I could do that <laughs> if somebody hurt my child. Yeah. But I don't think I had that before. I'm generally pretty laid back, but I, yeah, so kids, but my kids are grown now, so it's a little less intense, but my granddaughter is three, and so I'm like, I just yeah. can't even imagine. No, I guess, yeah. so that's, man, I think that's probably it. Um, my name's Kate. Uh, out of all of the history classes at Lakeside, which one would you say is the best? Oh, damn, probably. <laughs> Art history is pretty good, yeah. Uh, the, see, that's mean of you to ask that. Because, because, I the can four, just adopt myself out. I teach political science. Out of the, oh, yeah. Uh, out of the four that I teach, they're all so different, you know? Like, it's hard. It's, that's hard. I re, you know what? I really like teaching the sophomores because that leads to everything else. So I may have to, like, gravitate towards them because it's, it pushes them towards the rest of what we have to offer, you know, and if I don't think that, if I didn't teach the sophomores or if, or if we didn't have any kind of interaction with them, 
then maybe we wouldn't get because you know that that's that world history class is required, right? You have to have it to graduate, and you have to have U.S. Nothing against you, Kevin, but you have to have U.S. But everything else is an elective. Well, actually, in your AP level class is an elective, but technically, yeah, right? Technically. So. Uh, but for the kids who want to come back and want to come back and want to come back and take these other things, right, I think it has to start somewhere, and I think that we hook people there in the 10th grade and want them to come back and take things that they didn't have to. So I, uh, that's, that's probably my answer. But I really like the others, too, so I don't know. It hurts my I would like to, to say otherwise. Because AP is elective, but once you take elective, you've got to pass it to graduate. So well, it's kind of a required uh, yeah, well, class. Yeah, no, you're right. So, yeah, I, I like wish it. I had a senior-level elective that I could offer. Well, we're about to do African American history. We were going to do that, yeah. We just it got stomped on this year. But I focus too much teaching content, thinking about content in the classes that I teach. But if I had a senior level class that already had U.S. history, yeah, and that mm-hmm. knew all that stuff, where I didn't have to talk about that, and we could do the next level up, which is what I would. It's the stuff I ponder in class about. That's the I would like to do a class like that, but we don't have room for it. You know, we got to. Yeah. We got a lot of history electives already. It's, it's, um, I kind of wish that that RTI thing that we're doing, I, I almost wish that was a separate class. We could offer an eighth period for so people could do more electives yeah. if they wanted to. Like that would be kind of cool. Anyway, I don't know if the kids want that, but it seems like it would be a nice thing. Hello. I'm Kaylin. Get closer. There if you, you had the opportunity to change one of the faces on Mount Rushmore, who would it be and then who would you change it to? Can't we just add one? Sure. Chisel, chisel another one in. Who would you put? That's I, a good, yeah. Look, Teddy Roosevelt, he's, he doesn't hit me. Well, okay, the what was the decision the, to put Roosevelt on there? I'm just curious because you go. It's it was right after his death. It's, er, his, it's like, it huh? It was right after his death. Oh, And he I didn't was know such that. a big, you know, his FDR was like president. And so it's huh. like Roosevelt. When they, they just needed a tourist attraction, really. But I, it, Jefferson with the declaration, I mean, that's kind of tough. The, the ideals in which America was founded. George Washington, just kind of Lincoln, that's tough to replace. Preserving the Union. Teddy Roosevelt? I could probably think of other people to replace him. Replace him with the other Roosevelt? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Would it have to be a president? No. Uh, John Marshall? Mm. Alexander Hamilton? Nope. No. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Does it have to be a recognizable face? Because Roosevelt definitely had that. You know, oh, yeah. I can't picture oh, yeah. Marshall. I don't even know what the guy looked like. I know what he looks like. No, Maybe it's because he's not on a mountain somewhere. <laughs> I mean, Ben Franklin, John Adams, there's other founding fathers. I mean, Lincoln is the only one past the founding fathers that kind of had to go up to that level to save our country. Uh, the one that I think rises to that level might be FDR. FDR, maybe. Yeah. Hey, I can go with that. <laughs> one Roosevelt for another. <laughs> yeah, just wobble man. My name's Levi Duggar. Um, I'm sure all the students will find this very informational, too. Um, what are some of y'all's, like, most infamous pet peeves? Yeah, just from things that y'all find annoying for students to do In to class? Y'all. Oh, in, oh specifically, in class, specifically in class? Yeah, specifically in class. Uh, being on their phones constantly? Yeah, that That's does developed into a pet peeve when they're just constantly. I overlook it quite a bit until I just stop and stare. I, you know, this is not student related, but I really get annoyed when the intercom goes Ba-dong! and then they start listing off a thousand names that I've just and I'm like waiting and waiting because I got things I need to say and do and we need to interact and you're just like, oh, just, and then they and then they won't like pronounce all the names correctly. and I get a backtrack. It's just like I start banging my head against the wall. You know, who does not need to come? Can you do that? <laughs> list? <laughs> is, can there be a better way to do that? You know, I don't know. Maybe if we had like something like RTI where they could make the announcement beforehand. Mm, you know, only, maybe. Say, hey, at the beginning of fifth period, we need these people. Yeah, so the, the, those weird interruptions, you know, because we've only got 45 minutes now, and we start to deliver the same quality of it, you know. So any interruption can be just like... If you are incessantly oh, tapping your pen, that's my capital offense. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's... I'm literally picturing it and hearing it now. That's, that's, <laughs> that just tap, 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 and during like, and I'm just like, I'm going to lose my mind. D- that's pretty pissy of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my least favorite characteristic <laughs> of a kid that gets on my nerves is, Tapping. A, is a student that is just like, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, like apathy. N- not intellectually curious. Like you don't care. You don't want to know about this. No. 
You talking about that, that glazed donut look in and their eyes? And I'm like, this is advanced or AP. His, you just thought that would be a good idea. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, but this I sounds like a good class. Put me in the take. hard one. My friend <laughs> took it, so I'm here with them. Yeah, yeah. that's. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I don't know how to light that fire. But I just want them to care. I want them to want to know. It probably doesn't apply to anybody in here. But when you teach a lot of students over 20 years, like I have, there's been tons of them that's just like, I don't care. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a bothersome thing, too. So that's, that's an, I, we've never been asked that. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, my name is Jack Krause, and I wanted to ask, what do you guys think of standards-based grading? And I'm going to give a definition real quick. Okay. So only summative tests, uh, no formative assessments, and proficiency markers rather than actual grades. And I was wondering because it's starting to affect uh, college grade translation, scholarships, and high school education experience. AP Seminar has entered the chat. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing his... Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. I wondered. Yeah. I figured this one would get Nixon riled up, so... We, I mean, I'm waiting for Franklin to... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Solution tree. Yeah, so we, departmentally, we have strong feelings about this. Um, and we've expressed those strong feelings to uh, the, the people above us. Um, and we've had interdepartmental conversations about that very thing. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that idea. I think it waters down what, it, to, to me, it, it, it rewards mediocrity. And that's not what we're here to do. We're here to provide rigor. We've been taught our entire careers to push, 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 to try to elevate, to try to get you over a certain, you know, to, to, uh, to do more than what you've been doing. And what the standards-based grading system, in my opinion, ends up doing is, is stretching that out to the point where you, you can be rewarded for mediocrity. And that's just not something I think is in our best interest overall. Yeah, it's called the lowest common denominator. And with grade, the grade system, that's a traditional grading system, you, it's your boat to float. If you want an A, go get it. If you, if you want a C, go get it. With standards-based, I mean, we have a cl- – it would be idealistic and great, but everybody would need to be on a pretty similar level for that to work. And when you have some kids that are very high-achieving and very highly motivated and some that aren't – Well, the other that, thing the that, other thing that goes along with that is that they've pushed to couple up with it this concept that you can do whatever you need to do as a student in your own time, and we have to accept it without being able to say, we demand it now, and you can't, like, and you'll be, you will lose some credit for not doing it within a certain time frame. Life works in time frames. It's just part of the, part of the reality, and maybe we know that more because we study history and, and, and what happens to, to systems that do water themselves down and don't push for excellence uh, and, and try to lift up, not, not that we're trying to, to uh, ignore people who are struggling or to try to give people second chances or whatever, but I'm saying if, but we do have to have standards that are rigorous, and we need to be able to measure that in real time if you're meeting that or not. Because if you're not, then we need to address why that is or what we can do about it. But if it just takes, you know, if you can turn something in eight months later, which is part of what they actually suggested to us, uh, that just we can't make good decisions in in time enough to just to, to help people do better. My biggest complaint about it is that I feel like it creates an assembly line education system that it is it's <clears throat> it's built to um, take the individuality out of both teaching and learning and make us basically just cogs turn and run. Without us, actually. It I might mean, improve graduation rates, but it's not yeah. going to improve the quality of your learning or, nor the right. quality of the product of student that we turn out to the next part of the world. Okay, we got to go real quick now, yep. so we got time for two more really quick. Hello, Hi. I'm Samantha Phillips, and my question for you is, in all your years of teaching, have you ever had a student bring up, bring up a question that really changed your perspective on a historical event or a person? Pumphrey's nodding. I had it happen today. Oh. Huh, there you go. Well, you want to you share? Um, I forgot who it was. It might be somebody in here who talked about, we were talking about free blacks in the South at the time of the Civil War, and they asked, what about black masters? And I started thinking, were there black masters at, right before the Civil War in the mm-hmm. antebellum time? And it comes to find out there were yes, hundreds right. and hundreds. Now, I knew this early American history but I'd never thought about it before. And now, a lot of them were black masters because they bought their own family, which seems legit, and that's a good thing. 
but there were quite a bit of evidence of black masters that did it for the same reason white masters did it. Not to justify anything or make, but that definitely opened up a door to another perspective that I haven't thought about. I'm not saying it changed my philosophy on anything, but every year somebody says something and I'm the kind that's like, I don't know. We need to look that up. And today I, I spent very little time researching this, but it did at least open up. I didn't know that there were, because then when you think about reparations that people are talking about, woo, then it gets a little even more clunky about who deserves reparations if there were indeed black slave owners. <laughs> Yikes. So there's just that. Hi, I'm Lynn, and I'm a senior, but I still wanted to ask, is there going to be an update on African-American history in, at Lakeside? We don't know, um, is the short answer. Uh, you know, we were... How do I answer Poised. This? Yeah, we were ready. I mean, we had, uh, you, you know, you, you were in AP government. We did it. We did the research. We did the background. We found out that there was support for it. There was indeed support for it. Enough people signed up for it. Um, we created the schedule. Um, we all um, talked it through. Um, I put forward, because I'm on something called the Guiding Coalition. It's just neither here nor there. But we had it mapped out and ready. Um, and we were ready for it, and we wanted it to happen, and at the very last minute, it did not. We have not been told anything new. So, I mean, we're, kind of, we're hoping, but there's no As indication. As of now, they said the, the schedule wouldn't allow for it this year. Maybe in the future. I spent 15 to 20 hours getting ready because I wanted it to be good, and I took graduate-level classes in this. So this is one of those classes I get to, hey, we get to have a little more freedom. And then we didn't make, but hopefully next year. We'll see. But the interest is there, and I mean, yeah. you know that, and we've got the research to prove it. So. And moving forward, there's going to be continuous... We're going to push. I think people are going to continue to want that. So we'll, we'll keep... Uh, I mean, I'm assuming sooner or later we're going to get it. I don't, we don't really even know what the, what the conflict was this year that prevented it from being on the schedule. We weren't really privy to that information. So we'll, we'll see. Well, like there's, you know... Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for hanging out with us here at Collective hey. Coffee, and we will see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. Hey.